Hi, this is uh, Jay Harwood with a special edition of Amazing Mets Alumni Podcast. My special guest is my old friend, Roger McDowell. Roger, let me ask you a question. Are you still getting residuals from your appearance on a Jerry Seinfeld show 30 years ago? Yes, I am. Um, and and it's, it's not as frequent as it used to be, it's, but it's probably, I'd say about uh, once a month that uh, I get them and it's somewhere you know, $13, $14. Uh, sometimes you go to they, Wendy's or something, the McDonald's, right? Get a little burger for yourself? Oh, yeah, I get a Happy Meal. <laughs> let, let me ask this. The premise of the show, as I remember, you you came to the defense of Keith, who saved you a lot of runs at first base, right? I mean, sure. the, the, the George and Newman spit on him. I just get the details. Refresh my memory what the details were. Well, it was a spoof off the JFK second shooter. Um, right. And so... Um, the way the show goes, apparently Newman and Kramer were drawing with Keith, uh, called him pretty boy when he came out of the clubhouse. And I just happened to be, uh, up on the gravelly road behind the bushes. And, <laughs> um, I, I remember the old laughing, you know, yes, the old yes. laughing show where Artie Johnson, you know, parts the bushes and, and they, they kind of said, you know, okay. Do something like that. So that was kind of my acting bit. Uh, obviously, I didn't have a speaking part, but I did have a so-called spitting part. Um, but I will tell you this. After about 20 takes, I said, guys, I got no, I got no more saliva left. I, <laughs> I, I got nothing for you. I said, can I get a drink of water or something? And, and, and at that point, I remember them saying, well, just act like you're spitting. So you know, there, there was some acting involved. And so, uh, uh, like you said, 30 years later, I'm still getting residuals. And Did, and did Keith ever say thank you for coming to his defense, Roger? Uh, he, he, always, he always said thank you by his actions on the field. Right. You know, he always, he always picked me up. And uh, when, I needed, uh, when I needed a kick in the butt or a play to be made or something, he was always there. So, and, you know. It doesn't have to be always words that uh, that tell you that uh, they appreciate it, and a lot of times it's actions. Roger, I'm thrilled you one of the 65 people com coming back from our all Alzheimer's Day game, August 27th. Have you ever been to an, an Alzheimer's Day game before? Well, no, I've never. I mean, I'm just now an old timer. Um, I guess. I mean, I turned 61 uh, last December, and and so I haven't been to an old timers game. I, you know, I, I've seen plenty of them and, and been uh, at the ballpark both as a player and as a coach uh, we'd go to various ballparks and they'd have the old timers games and and how neat it was to uh, to, to see the history of the you know the organization and and to see the guys come back and the camaraderie and uh, it is it's a big fraternity and it doesn't matter what era or what year you played you're you're a part of an organization and, and once you're part of you always will be 13 guys from the 86 team are going to be back, which should be nice. Uh, I mentioned about two guys who, in my mind, get overlooked a little bit. Um, Kevin Mitchell that year was a rookie. He played shortstop, played the outfield. You know, I think Gary named the world because he switched around so many positions. What, what do you remember about Kevin's contributions to the 86 team that year? Well, see, Kevin and I came up through the minor leagues with the Mets together. So we, we'd already formed a relationship and a friendship. Um, and uh, the part that I remember and really looking back is, and you remember so well, Jay, is that Kevin was our basically our fourth outfielder and he was our fifth infielder. Um, and Davey would plug him in because offensively he was a force. And so Davey would plug him in. Uh, you know, he'd give him starts here and there, but mostly it was off the bench as a pinch hitter, right-handed hitter off the bench, and also to give uh, some of the regulars a, a rest, a, a day. And you know, I remember, uh, I remember very vividly that the uh, the time that Davey put uh, Kevin Mitchell at shortstop, and uh, the the media kind of questioned the fact whether Mitchell could play shortstop and. Lo and behold, he made some uh, tremendous plays, he made the routine plays and made some really good plays, um, but also gave us a force with his bat. So um, uh, when you think about guys on that team and, and looking back, uh, the, the platoons that we had um, and the guys that, uh, you know, the Kevin Mitchells that uh, were, were plug-in guys who 
Kevin goes on to, you know, basically almost win a triple crown a few years later. Uh, I believe it was in uh, San Diego, was it, Jay, that he almost won a triple crown? Or was it San, yeah, San Francisco, wasn't it? Or my mistake? San Francisco. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Aguilera, Rick Aguilera was a, a swing guy. I mean, it was like when, when there was a guy to get skipped, uh, Aggie was a guy to get skipped, and he became the long man in the bullpen. And, uh, you know, the four starters with, uh, with Doc and, and Ronnie and, and Sid and Bobby, um, you know, it, it, was, it was quite the team because you had, remember, you had platoons at second, right? Wally and Tough. You had platoon at third with Hojo and Ray. You basically had a platoon in center with, with Lenny and Mookie and Mookie moving over to left a lot of times when Lenny played center. And you had a platoon uh, as a closer with uh, both Jesse and I. So it, it, was, it was a lot of guys that contributed in different ways. And true, Davey was not always one. Really nice. Never took a he was oh, took a chance. He gambled. You know, I go to one specific game in uh, Cincinnati in in uh, in July of '86. We get to a big fight. Why to get to a fight? You guys got to a fight uh, when uh, Eric Davis slid into Ray Knight at third base, and sure. guys got ejected. And you remember you and Jesse ended the game in the outfit. I remember you call a ball in left field or something. He would you would alternate back and forth. And you know, David he didn't he rolled the dice. He was a Las Vegas gambler. He he didn't manage by the rules, don't you think? I mean Yeah, J Davey was I don't want to say ahead of his time, but he was uh he thought um about the athleticism of his guys and, and what they're able to do. We just talked about Kevin Mitchell playing shortstop. Um and and uh you know, if you remember that game, Jay, I didn't catch the ball in left field. Jesse caught. Jesse did. Right. Jesse caught the ball. Tony Perez hit a line drive off me when I was pitching, and, and uh, Jesse caught the ball in right field. I will tell you this. Um, I believe it was Max Venable when Jesse was pitching, and I was in left field, and he did loft a nice little fly ball to, I'd say, more left than left center. And I was camped under, and it was it would have been the third out, and it would have been great to be able to put, have a put out in the outfield. And so I'm camped under, and I'm looking up, and the ball is getting ready to come in my glove. And this foot steps on my foot, and the glove goes in front of my glove. And it was Lenny coming over from center field, cut right in front of me, stepped on my foot, caught the ball, and I said, Lenny, what are you doing? He goes, just wanted to be sure, man. <laughs> so, Roger, so, but you know what? But you, but huh? He didn't trust it. <laughs> yeah, no. But he seen me shag. That's and that's where Davey got the idea, I think, because Jesse and I would shag in the outfield during batting practice, and that's how we got our conditioning in. And we would shag the whole batting practice and catch fly balls. And both of us had some athleticism and, and could kind of hold our own out there defensively, um, from the standpoint of catching the lazy fly balls. But you know, if you remember, the other part is um, Gary Carter went to third base. Right. And there was a big, big bunt play um, where I know I was in left field because of extra innings, and they had first and second, uh, the Reds, and uh, there was a bunt play on it. And Keith, from his position at first place, knew that they were going to bunt. And uh, he came across the field and fielded a bunt on the third base side of the pitcher's mound and threw to Gary at, at third and then the relay to first for a double play. And I, I don't want to say that epitomized our season, but that was, you know, one, an unbelievable anticipatory play by, by Keith and had the ability to make it, but also having, having Gary at third base and then throwing the first. And tough a court to pull at second base, if I remember. No, first. At first. Right. Yeah. Talk about, you mentioned Keith. I mean, I, I spoke to Doc and to Ronnie, some of the other pitchers. When you were on the mound, was he like a, a Mel's assistant pitching coach, Salva Meyer? <laughs> What did he mean to you as a pitcher having keys at first base? It was comfort, a uh, comfortable feeling. It was comfortable feeling because um, he, he, he made you feel very confident. He, he, he exuded kind of, and, as you know, and people around the Mets that followed that team, he was a very confident, a confident person. Um, and he was infectious with the rest of the club. It was weakened. It, it was never a doubt whether a play would be made, whether we would win or lose. We were always, it was always glass half full. 
Um, and yes, he was, he was the guy out there on, on the field. He was, he was the general, he was patent. He was patent on the field and giving us opportunity to, to, um, he made plays because of the athleticism of our, of our pitching staff, he was able to play a defensive position that he may not have been able to play on a less athletic pitching staff because he knew that he could play deeper. He could play more in the hole the, towards second base because he knew that, that the pitcher would be at first base covering first base. And so he, he invariably cut off a lot of base hits to right field uh, just because of where he positioned himself. And, and he knew he knew the game so well. He knew the hitters so well around the league. He'd been around the league, and he just gave us as a staff a lot of confidence. And you know, if we needed a kick in the butt, he gave it to us. If we needed a you know a comforting shoulder, he gave it to us. Not many times did we need that comforting shoulder because we knew that uh, you know what we weren't going to get somebody to <laughs> somebody's shoulder to cry on. He was going to say, hey, "Listen, we can do this." Roger, I mean, another guy I want to give props to is Bobby Ojeda. I know he's a good friend of yours. Um, you know, in the game one against the playoffs, we lose. Bobby pitches it, I think, five to one win in Houston. We lose the first two games in the World Series. He goes up to his own stomping grounds in Boston, pitches a great game and wins. You know, didn't have a 95 mile an hour fastball, but he found a way to win 18 games in the regular season. And we wouldn't have gotten where we were without him, don't you think? Well, if, if you look, if you look up complete pitcher, he's probably one of the one, one of the pictures you see next uh, next to that definition because, you know, he like you said he didn't have an overpowering fastball. He was he was a good locator. He 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 knew and had anticipation on on uh, what hitters were trying to do. Uh, he had you know an extreme confidence and also the, he had the ability that he wasn't afraid to throw any pitch in any count at any time, you know, whether it's bases loaded and three and two and two out or, or nobody's on. Um, and so, you know, Bobby, Bobby was the key to, I think the key to that pitching staff because, you know, you'd already had doc and Ronnie and Sid was still young coming up. Um, and Bobby solidified from I would probably say from the veteran leadership standpoint um, on the pitching staff uh, and he knew how to add and subtract. He knew um, the positions of his fielders and he had the confidence of the greatest pitchers ever to play the game. I mean, he had all that confidence when he went out there and you talk about that game, um, you know, in Houston, the first game, but he also, if you remember, he gave up three runs in that uh, deciding sixth game. He gave up three runs in the first inning and somehow shut him down until, you know, we eventually had an opportunity to come back uh, against uh, Nepper in the ninth. Let me, let me say this. Uh, I've been around a long time. Game six, probably the most exciting game I've ever been involved with. We're losing, you know, I, I go, went, used to go down in the locker room and, wait for the players to come in. I think I sat in the same place from the eighth inning to the 16th inning. We score three runs at the top of the ninth inning, get Snepper, tie the game up. You go on to pitch five innings, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. That's five, right? 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, right? Yeah. Uh, do you ever you move got five over? fingers. Yeah, I, I, I'm <laughs> counting on my fingers. I can't count up to five, Roger. I mean, you give up one hit, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And we all feared, what fear did you have of Mike Scott and his scuff balls? I mean, I'm, I'm losing that game to go to game seven. I remember everybody was looking at the balls in the dugout. Right. You know, he shut us down for two games. Do you ever pitch any more pressure than you did those five innings? No, I don't think so, Jay. I mean, looking back at, at the time, you, I guess you feel the pressure. I mean, in the moment, you feel the pressure, but looking back, um, what evolved around that pressure and you start thinking about it. But at the time it was like, you know, listen, I, I gotta, I gotta get three outs so that we have an opportunity to get some runs. And, and that was my, that was my mindset. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you remember Jay, but during the course of the year, I hadn't pitched very well against the Astros and no, I think I was 0 and 3 with about a 14 ERA and lost, you know, that, those three that's games. not good, right? 14 ERA is not good. No, it's not good. And okay. I remember, no, I, I, remember I remember going into the um, into that 
that playoffs. And I remember the USA Today, and, you know, at the time, that was a big um, baseball um, information source. And so I remember reading this little note, you know, saying, you know, Roger McDowell was 0-3 with a 14 against the Astros and, uh, you know, see what happens here. And, you know, as you know, when being with us, I had teams that I pitched against and Jesse had teams that he pitched against. And the Astros really weren't my team. And it's kind of like, you're our, you're kind of our latch this ditch effort when we run out of the other pitchers, because, um, you know, in all reality, they had predominantly left-handed hitting lineup. Most, I mean, in the Astrodome, they played on AstroTurf, which was not my friend. And uh, for whatever reason, they hit me very well. So going into that series, you know, I always had that in the back of my mind is like, Oh my God, I mean, you know, I pitched against these guys all season and didn't do very well. And hopefully this will be a little bit better situation and, and an outcome. And fortunately for me, it was. We There were some really two or three really good defensive plays. I think uh, Elster made one at shortstop and I think Keith made two at uh, at first base. And, and so um, I, I was fortunate. And the, the hit I gave up to Kevin Bass, I think, was in my – last inning and then Gary throws him out at second base and so I was very fortunate so I mean it was you know knowing that we had to face Mike Scott the next day yeah but you know at the time it was like you know our whole belief and you remember this our whole belief was that if we get into another team's bullpen we would win the game and so we were in their bullpen and and Dave Smith didn't have a whole lot of success against us as their closer right. so it was uh it was one of those games like you know Roger, you know the crazy thing about the game? Uh, uh, we went 16 innings. We used Ojeda, Aguilera, McDowell, Orozco, right? That was, that's was four pitchers. Four pitches for 16 innings. You think that would happen today? <laughs> there <laughs> might be four pitches in, in four innings. but is that, That's crazy. But it's, a, it's a different game. You know I mean? Yeah. It is. It's a, it's a totally different game. But, uh, you know, I, rem I remember um, my turn was coming up to bat. I think it was in my after my third inning of work, or maybe it was after my second inning of work. And my turn is coming up the bat, and I'm thinking, this is the playoffs. There's no way I'm hitting, right? And so um, Mel comes down and says, uh, you know, Roger, get your stuff ready to hit. And I think it was all predicated on uh, if, if the leadoff guy got on, I would not hit. And, and it, I think it was Lenny uh, was hitting in front of me, and Davey – maneuvered the lineup, um, but uh, I got my stuff up there and I got ready to hit. And I said, well, I guess I'm going out to pitch again. And so, uh, yeah, we four innings, uh, four pitchers in 16 innings. That's uh, it's pretty incredible, especially in the playoffs when everything means everything. Roger, don't, don't get me mad when I bring this up. I have a reason for bringing this up. You were together with Buck for one year uh, mm -hmm. in 2018. You know, two years, coach, two two years, two years, two years, years. and um, you know, major league pitch coach for 13 years. Your last year at Baltimore probably wasn't a great record, right? I mean, um, no, I it, you, we weren't good, and our pitch staff was the worst in the league. Well, but I mean, I'm sure it wasn't, really, but I think you won 47 games that year. Yeah, I don't, but, I don't remember. I don't, want to, I don't want to laugh, Roger. I don't want to laugh. <laughs> but what, okay. did, what did you get? I mean, working with Buck. It's tough to lose all those games. I mean, how was he with you? I mean, and then my second question is, are you surprised at all? I mean, the success he's had, I'm, I'm sure you, you're not surprised uh, what he's done with the Mets this year. Did you, was that a forerunner of you? Would you expect it, how we would do here? So if, if you want me to talk about Buck, how long is this podcast? Uh, well, I think we run out about 20 minutes, right? <laughs> okay. Well, I tell you, I mean, I, Obviously, I've had an opportunity to work with uh, Bobby Cox, Freddie Gonzalez, Brian Snicker, and, and Buck Showalter. And, and uh, Buck Show, Showalter is someone that I um, am very fortunate that I got to work for. I'd always heard stories about Buck. You know, Carlos Tosca was one of our coaches in Atlanta, and he would always tell me stories about Buck, you know, and, 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 and how um, complete – of a manager from the standpoint of managing the game, knowing the game, 
um, being professional, knowing his players, knowing his the ability of his players, um, multitasking. I mean, I'm talking about multitasking, Buck, there's a second, there's second, Buck's second to none. It's, it's impressive. And, and, and the knowledge of, of what he does on, an, on a daily basis, preparing for a game, um, taking whatever it is that is given to him, whether it's video, whether it's data <laughs> analytics, whether it's the trainer, training staff, uh, whether it's one of the coaches so overhearing something, whatever it is, uh, he, he takes all these things in and, and, and uh, runs a, the, the best bullpen I've ever been around. Um, I would say in the two years I was there, um, there were probably on one hand, the number of times a pitcher got up in the bullpen and didn't get in the game, which from a bullpen standpoint, you love because um you know, when you get up in that bullpen and knowing what it is like to be a reliever, when you get up in the bullpen, you get ready, 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 and, and you don't get in the game, and you don't get in the game that night, it's, it is it is a game for you. Um, but it takes its toll over the course of the season. You do that a bunch of times, and at the end of the year, your pitchers are not, you know, your relievers are not going to, you know, be able to wipe their butt. And so, um Especially in, in that last month, you want you want those guys fresh, you want them healthy, and you want them at their best. But I I learned so much from Buck from um, just from how to prepare for a game uh, and and knowing I'd already been a pitching coach for eleven years, and I got the opportunity to work with Buck for two years, and I'm, I'm telling you what, um, it, it's it's eye opening. Um, he has a great sense of humor, um, and that's one of the things that you know you hear about great managers. And usually, uh, it, they're, they're very workmanlike, and they look very workmanlike. Um, his ability to speak with the press, uh, his his ability to have a relationship with the press, his ability to have a relationship with the city, and uh, you know you saw it in Baltimore, and you're starting to see it in New York that. Uh, the relationship with, with the fans, with the city. And, and obviously, you know what, when you win, yeah, it's, it's better. So I, uh, I was very fortunate and I apologize for taking so long, but it, yeah, it's not, a, it's not an easy answer because, you know, he's, he's really good. He's yeah. really good. You know what, Roger, you know, I've been working with the alumni the last couple of years and, we, and in the summer, the spring, he makes the time to know the guys comes over, he shook Ed Crankville's hand or Chamsky's hand. He, he wants the players, the Mets to know a sense of history. So he gets it. You know what I mean? He, he wants the players to know about the past, which is really great from my end, what we're trying to do from the alumni side. Well, He's that, a that's, that's, that's what I was getting ready to say. He gets it. He gets it. He gets the fact that, uh, you know, th there were people before him that, that made this game. And he respects that. And he gets it. And he wants to show, uh, you know, a lot of people want to show their appreciation for him. He wants to show his appreciation for those guys that came before him, and uh, you know that that were. Yeah, it's great. It's respect, really true. respectful it's of the game. You know, it's, it's uh, and the account of, and and the other part about Buck, and I, 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 things keep keep popping in my mind, but the accountability. You know, his accountability, his coaches' accountability, the players' accountability, not only to themselves but the city and to the organization. Um, it's it's, it's off the charts. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, what he's doing this year is tremendous. He's going to keep it going. Uh, one of my favorite guys with the Mets, um, Bill Robinson, the late Bill Robinson, unfortunately passed away a little bit ago. Uh, our Bill's widow, uh, Mary, is coming to the old timers at game. Good. And on more than one occasion, Roger, you almost killed Bill at first base. Not intentionally, but the master of the hot foot, you and Hojo, and in more than one occasion, Uncle Bill, as he used to call him, right. was the recipient of the hot foot. Why don't you tell the people it, how you put together a good hot foot? Well, the, 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 I guess the pieces of the hot foot aren't readily available anymore. I mean, you know, I mean obviously the cigarettes are, but the, the book of matches that you wrap around the cigarette, um, the gaff tape is still available and, and we use, you know, Howard and I, you know, experiment with a lot of different things. First, we started with bubble gum. Then we figured out, you know what, you got to chew the bubble gum a long time to get the sugar out. 
so it stays sticky. And then it was a little too long of a process. And so we started uh, experimenting with tape to tape the, uh, the the matchbooks where you had to take apart um, to get the two strips of matches. You had to take the little uh, staple out to get the two strips of matches. And so we experimented with, you know, um, how tight to wrap it around the cigarette because if you wrapped it too tight, uh, you know, it's kind of like we were scientists to, to some degree. <laughs> you were scientists, uh, yes, you were. Yeah, and and so it was like you know you couldn't wrap it too tight, or the the uh, the air wouldn't allow the cigarette to burn down to ultimately light the matches. So Bill became a favorite target because usually he was closest to the dugout, and you had a better chance of the hot foot, uh, the cigarette not. Uh, extinguishing itself because of his proximity to the dugout. And so, plus, you know, I mean, in all reality, you know, what's the first base coach, you know, you know I know what he does, but to the, to the fan, it's like, okay, what do you say? You know, you grab the gloves, you get, grab the gear, you go, all right, you know, take your lead, go get on the line drive, look at the third base coach, <laughs> da, da, da. And so, you know, you know, from a responsibility standpoint, Bill had responsibilities, but not to the extent of Buddy over at third base or Sam Palazzo. And so uh, Bill became like an easy target. Um, it, I mean, it, wait a minute. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. You know, and, and, and it, it kind of became, I think there were times that he knew it was on, but because of, uh, you know, maybe we lost a game or two and he wanted to get some levity. And so... He was an easy target. Especially like the, the dugouts in Cincinnati were long dugouts and almost got to first base. I remember one time, I remember just hopping around and almost falling down there. Roger, another one of your expertise was firecrackers in the dugout more than yeah. once. You know. You, talk, but, you talked about the four pitchers in 16 innings in that playoff game. Yes. What would happen now if the fire firecrackers went off after the advance or anthem in the dugout? They would, they would evacuate the stadiums, I think. <laughs> But that was, I don't know what it was. I mean, I think we'd gone through a, a spell of where we uh, we weren't hitting very well. Uh, we were in a little bit of an offensive slump. And I don't know where I got the firecrackers. They were black cats and there was a whole strip of them. And so I got the idea of just, you know, lighting our bats up and, you know, getting a little, a little explosion on the bats. And so after one of the national anthems, um, and again, it, I think the first time was at home because, uh, you know, at home you could do things that sometimes you couldn't do uh, when you're on the road. And so, you know, after one of the, uh, the national anthem, uh, I lit these things up and they went off and it, uh, I think we broke out for some runs that day. So it was a good it was, thing. It was a good, uh, did you, have you seen the Let's Go Let's Go video in a while? That was one of my favorite videos. No, with the pop. no, I, I haven't, Jay. I haven't and, seen, I haven't seen that in a while. No, I remember kids bobblehead going back and forth. But, <laughs> right, I tell you, Roger, I'm really looking forward to August 27th. You know, 65 guys, different eras. You know, you've had a lot of the 86 guys will be there. It'll be fun, reminiscent, and you're a big part of our history. You've been a good friend all these years, and you always been there for me when I needed you. And once again, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. And look forward anytime, to seeing you in a couple of anytime months. Anytime and always. And look forward to the old timers game and looking forward to seeing you again. Yeah. I've got, yeah, I haven't got any better looking, Roger. Uh, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you. See you in a couple right. of months, Roger. Be well. All right. Adios. All right, guys.